Whoa, he went I all out. I have someone who remembered it was St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> what? That's awesome. I love the LED. Is that LED that like or the light scheme all year round, or is it only for today? It, I have two sets of LEDs now, and they can each be different. And because the karaoke setup is here, the green that you see can be light reactive on a number of different settings. That's okay. pretty cool. I'm I'm impressed. I mean, that is a that is a baller setup. My my house is like it's like Animal Crossing wall coverings. It is not the same as your very impressive lions fighting in the background. So, yeah, someone asked me about the tapestry, and it was just cool. I used to have a big office, so I bought it for one of the walls, but I like it. So it would be my tapestry if I had to choose one. Are we are we correct in that you're yet another SIG Inter or former SIG Inter? Yeah, I, someone else was a former SIG Inter, and he claimed to be a former Marine, but I've heard there's no such thing as a former Marine. That is what it said in the bio. So we're just going to have to believe what he sent in. And I feel like we're uh, like the Association of Old Crows has decided to descend upon us. I, I mean, that's some, you know, DC insider stuff going on here. That's um, deep now. That's deep. So uh, what better right. what better people to understand, you know, the intelligence process in DOD, though? Right? I mean, like, it's natural, natural fit to help in cybersecurity from that field. I I think, you know, one of the things that they've always told me is that, like, human lies and SIGINT never does because people don't lie to themselves, but they will definitely lie to you. Human lies, but SIGINT never does. No, SIGINT is SIGINT. the ground truth. That's how it works. SIGINT, SIGINT is comprised of data, mm -hmm. but... You have to understand, like, when we are talking about intercepting, like, you know, cell phones as an example, um, people are going to lie on the phone. Is it my phone? Is it his phone? Whose phone is it? Who owns the phone? How long have they had the phone? It's not as simple. Not as simple. And but deriving humans. intelligence from that data is another is another question altogether, which In, I actually think one of our former speakers addressed. Yeah, uh, one, Look at one me of the tying it speakers, back to a previous talk. I love it. Yeah, it, if you have intelligence without analysis, it is just data. There, there, it has to be analyzed so far by humans. I don't think we will be having AI robots replace humans for terms of intelligence analysis. I will say there has been some advances in terms of. Um, Find, when you get a mass amount of data, being able to do like subject matter analysis. And so like if I want to separate all the um, Russian bots who are spewing a very particular trend of thought, even though they're using different phrases and words, you often can do a lot of work with that. But I think I think oftentimes the application of ML is uh, is something to ameliorate the, the the challenge and to aid the humans, not to remove the humans from the loop entirely. And I think the focus on on aiding humans in the loop, uh, categorizing the data faster, helping us analyze the data faster in any in any intelligence, whether it's SIGINT or human or cyber threat intelligence, um, is going to be vital because there's far too much data for any person to look at. Right, so can we automatically categorize events that are attacking my infrastructure against the MITRE ATT&CK framework with like 90% success? Like, that would be fantastic. And then, you know, categorize the level of concern or risk of those events so I can look at what I need to look at because I'm never gonna look at everything. I think well, that's exactly right. I, we should do your intro, and we have not done your intro. We have just decided- Go ahead. Oh, Bryson. Yeah, no, I want to do a public service announcement. Um, so uh, for those of you who are concerned about the schedule, it's like all conferences, right? There's more than one track. There is no way to take it all in. Take a break, drink some water, step away. These in-betweens are just us doing banter. You're not going to miss anything. Take a break. Uh, everything is recorded. It'll be there for you later, right? Okay, so do not hurt yourself trying to catch, catch everything. 
Uh, we love that you're there. That you're that excited that there's this much awesome from all the volunteers and the speakers and the coaches that have made this possible. Um, and of course, my my guest MCs. Uh, but you know, do it at your own pace, okay? And now we'll introduce John. Very well, at least. I don't know if I'm the the best suited for it because I have never played Dungeons and Dragons. I am what? sorry to say it's oh, been I on my to-do list, but I was going to form my group and then the pandemic happened. And so Wait. I have not yet done it. Can I ask John a quick question first? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. When when if you grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons for 30 years, right? And that means that your internal understanding of people has an alignment chart as its basis. I assume. So which alignment are you? I'm chaotic good. Okay, because I assume that everyone in our industry will say they are chaotic good. If other people were talking about you, what would they say you were? Chaotic is, neutral? Is chaotic the neutral. alignment chart from Dungeons and Dragons that chaotic good? Yes. yes. I spent several hours trying to explain to my nephew who was about eight at the time how morality worked and why we couldn't just kill all the villagers in explanation of the alignment chart um so he may grow up to be a very smart uh very scary person but you know hopefully hopefully he'll learn but uh i was like no that that's evil that's evil can't just kill all the villagers i think my favorite alignment chart i will be honest is the doug song alignment chart where he labeled different companies and personas in the information security space. And of course he put immunity as neutral evil, which I feel is an accurate reflection. You need to so, drop that in the Discord because I haven't seen that. I want to check that out. I will I've drop it in that. the Discord, but I'm excited for your talk because I've actually gotten a huge amount of value from my Dungeons and Dragons experience, doing military war games of all the weirdest things because they are the same thing. And so I'm really excited about this. And um, I guess without further ado, we should let you do it. Well, he's got he's got two more minutes before we start. Oh, so we want I, to keep I can, we're I taking a break the, right now. I can give the intro. So five o'clock. Okay. okay. Um, this is a lighthearted, career-focused talk uh, uh, that will discuss non-hard cyber skills and why they're important in cybersecurity. As a three-plus-year player and dungeon master with Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, he thought this talk might lure in some folks to discuss soft skills. Uh, he, he thought it might also help overcome imposter syndrome because for a lot of roles, you need to be well-rounded. D&D taught him how to think on his feet, resolve conflicts with people you consider your friends. Um, <clears throat> uh, and as a, as a dungeon master, uh, he, he game planned what if scenarios quickly and learned how to tell stories, which are critical to lots of roles. I apologize for slightly butchering that. And also I have to say, me not knowing that those uh, charts had something to do with Dungeons and Dragons will now forever be recorded. Um, so I'll we'll just have to live with that. But I'm very excited for this talk. And for those of you who do like playing Dungeons and Dragons, my virtual happy hour will be a choose your own adventure as we go through an incident response. You don't want to miss that. I will try to be there, but you do not want to miss that. All right. So am I sharing my screen? I see it. It's beautiful. All right. So thanks to the GrimCon volunteers and Bryson for letting me speak here today. Um, I think this is the third GrimCon I've been involved with in some capacity, and they've all been super excellent. Um, so I am in Discord. I obviously probably can't keep an eye on that while I'm giving the presentation, uh, but I'll be available for questions there afterwards. And as long as I feel good later, I will try to join the Choose Your Own Adventure, and I won't give anything away. So um, just a little bit about me. I'm not going to spend too much on this, but I am apparently the second former SIGINT uh, personnel who presented today. So that's very interesting. Um, SIGINT is signals intelligence. Um, if you have questions about that, I will tell you what I can about that uh, offline. You can DM me. Um, 
I have a whole bunch of certifications, which was being discussed in the chat. I have a whole bunch of certifications because they helped me advance my career. Um, we can discuss whether or not any or all of them are actually helpful for any or all of the work I've done in this field. I've been in cybersecurity for about 11 years with 21 total in like Intel and DoD. Uh, most of my experience since I got out in 2010 has been focused on the DoD um, and mostly in and around the Fort Meade, Maryland region. I'm also huge into soccer, huge into soccer, and obviously role-playing games and Dungeons and Dragons. So if you have just joined this talk and you have no idea what Dungeons and Dragons is, I'm going to give like a quick maybe two-minute overview. So this is a fantasy often described as tabletop role-playing game. Plenty of Dungeons & Dragons games have gone virtual, especially during the pandemic, or can be done virtually. I prefer the in-person as opposed to virtual. Ideally, two to eight people, typically your friends. Um, and it's really funny because pretty much the nerdiest game on Earth requires you to have a group of friends to play, whether online or in-person, right? Uh, I am the Liverpool fan also, so I'll try to keep an eye on Discord, and boy, our season, whew. Um, so books, dice, miniatures, which are little tiny figures we use to represent things that are happening on sort of like a, a battlefield when you encounter monsters. You'll hear the term dungeon master or game master quite regularly. So a lot of a lot of RPGs say game master now because it has, you know, not any weird connotations with it. So that's sort of the organizer. So that's who's running and building the session, who's sort of directing the group of player characters through the story and everybody else is making up the adventuring party so everybody makes up some sort of a character and they role play as that character they're the adventuring party the dungeon master or game master then throws things in story at them and then that adventuring party is reacting to what's going on it's sort of like a play where you are given a part, except there are no scripts, and you actually don't know what the play's about, and you just show up on stage, and then stuff happens, and you have to play your character. If anybody is familiar with murder mysteries, it's very much like a murder mystery where you're given a part to play. We use a lot of dice. So you will see polyhedral dice, D20s, D6s, D4s, they're the worst to step on. And I actually have so many dice, it's not funny. So you've probably, if you've ever gone to the game store, you are familiar with this. It can take a lot of different forms. Um, so there's some terrain setups. Lots of tabletop RPGs are gonna look like this in some capacity, or they're gonna look like this in some capacity. You can see the dice, you can see all the miniatures. Everybody has their player character sheet in front of them. And that's a really large group to be playing a tabletop game if they are all actually involved. And Dungeons and Dragons is pretty much suited for all ages, probably like 10 and up. And then obviously you can cater to, to the needs of the group. So many books, so many books are required for Dungeons and Dragons, right? And that actually leads me in to my first uh, actual topic about research and reading comprehension. I remember when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons around the age of like 12 or 14, I just came across all these terms and all these rules and words, and I had to like go look up. And that's pretty much the first time I've ever encountered the terms meritocracy, oligarchy, patriarchy, right? It was from reading Dungeons and Dragons books. And frankly, Dungeons and Dragons is the reason I became an avid reader when I was in my preteens and early teens. It was nothing to do with our English class. It was all about reading basically any Dungeons and Dragons book or any novel based on Dungeons and Dragons I could, right? So I will say that the complexity and depth of material that most people who are involved in role-playing games is familiar with and and consumes regularly is frankly astounding if you've never been around the role-playing community before, right? I mean, people will have hundreds of books and the books will oftentimes have hundreds of pages and we'll reread things and some of its rules and some of it's just stories and there's a lot of fantasy novels built in and around all of these worlds that exist in fantasy role-playing as well. And then you have someone else, I think, on the on the uh, on the other track, on track two, was talking about his love of Harry Potter and Lords of the Rings, and that all gets uh, you know involved into this as well. So I say that this is one of the first items because for those of us in IT tech, cybersecurity, this ability to read 
for actual comprehension and to do significant research is required for any role, right? I don't care what it is that you're doing. We Google or Bing so much to answer questions because we'll never know everything stuff and information is coming out regardless of your specialization in the cyber threat intel world right we're we're constantly inundated with new information about adversaries new tactic tactics techniques and procedures ttps if you're on the pen test side right there's new tools that are coming out you so this ability to read large volumes of data, understand what that data is actually telling you, um, to be able to skim information, uh, to be able to do effective research on cybersecurity and tech topics. I feel like if those are things that you're good at, and maybe you're good at it not because you're involved in Dungeons and Dragons or an RPG, maybe you're good at it for some other reason, those skills carry over to pretty much any role in IT or cybersecurity. Right, so that's my first one. And again, some of this is, especially for my junior folks, you might watch this now or watch it later. There's a lot of imposter syndrome. These are skills that are critical for our industry that you have or that you could bring to the table even into a junior entry level role, right? So if you're really good at this, then you can always keep in the back of the mind what I'm really good at that is actually applicable to my job. And this is one of those skills. This is a big one, communication. I'm not the first person to talk about communication today, um, both written and verbal communication. So written communication in the world I work in is so critical, right? There are some really excellent examples and there are some really poor examples of communication in multiple forms, whether it's uh, you know very technical communication, some sort of like a NIST publication, um, whether it's a verbal presentation that someone is giving, internal, maybe it's feedback about an incident, right? There's all sorts, communication is so critical for this industry. And frankly, we should do better at communicating with each other and cross teams and cross specializations and in our purple team engagements, right? I don't care where you work in tech or where you work in cybersecurity, this communication and how to do it well is critical. And if you are used to being involved in role-playing games, you know this is true as well, right? So, you know, verbal communication skills around the role-playing games is gonna carry over because you also probably have been developing some empathy through some of the role-playing games. Not everyone does, but hopefully you learn to be empathetic with the other players that are playing. You might even learn empathy through playing a role that you aren't that familiar with, right? So, you know, you play a role as an elf or a dwarf, and there are certain stereotypes with that, right? So you can actually learn empathy through role-playing games as well. I'm gonna come back to that a little later. Um, so I think these written and verbal skills are critical. The other thing is that, and broadly speaking here, a lot of very technical people, very hands-on keyboard people, really don't enjoy writing the reports. They don't enjoy that aspect of the job. Now, that's not true for everyone. But in a lot of cases, some of those people have chosen to do very technical hands-on types of things because that's what they like to do, right? So someone needs to write the report. Someone on the red team needs to write a report that is excellent right so who's going to do that i personally have worked with a number of people who work in the pen testing field who have told me they don't like writing right it's just not something they're comfortable with or that they prefer to do right so it's not an aspect of the job they love this is so important and some of the things you can bring to the table with communication written and verbal is that empathy and emotional iq which is often abbreviated EQ when we're communicating, right? So those are some skills that you might have from this hobby that you are bringing into the workplace. The next topic, cooperative problem solving. All right. Yeah, someone in chat is, says, don't be a pen tester if you can't write. There's, uh, there's a lot of jobs where you shouldn't go to the job if you don't think that writing 
or communicating verbally is going to be really critical. Um, cooperative problem solving. Um, we all see this in the role playing games, right? There's a group of players and the game master is throwing out some sort of problem encounter that they have to deal with, right? So there's immediate cooperative problem solving. And then there's sort of the in game, right? The players, you know, the elves and the dwarves figuring out what to do. And then there's the meta game, the out of game problem solving that all role playing groups are going to have, right? Like. They will be, there will be a discussion amongst your adventuring party, the actual people you know, you know, Jenny and Billy and Fred, as to what best way to solve the problem. And then there is the in-game problem solving of what their elven wizard and dwarven paladin think they should do with in-game knowledge. Right, so there's actually two levels to interesting cooperative problem solving that exist in the most role-playing games, right? So this cooperative problem solving and hearing other people's ideas and taking different ideas into consideration, yeah, you're probably going to need that until you die, right? So throughout your whole working life, and I assume into the retirement community, there is going to be cooperative problem solving, right? At every level, whether it's the most junior person trying to resolve, you know, a JIRA ticket in the system, or whether it's a cooperative problem solving in the C-suite about where we're gonna spend, you know, the remaining $2 million this quarter, it is all cooperative problem solving. And there are people who are really good at cooperative problem solving, and there are some people who probably could use some training on cooperative problem solving. One thing that I heard recently that really stuck with me, and I think this kind of goes into cooperative problem solving a little bit as well, is influence and having spheres of influence and good leaders will create spheres of influence and poor leaders will create spheres of control you will see this in role-playing groups some gms or dms want to control groups some players want to control groups and be the dictator and there are other people that are much better at cooperative problem solving because there may be more than one way to do something and the group has to agree on what the best way is. And you will find that there are people who are better at understanding different people's perspectives and taking that into account and considering alternatives. And those are all critical skills pretty much anywhere, but. But since we are in the InfoSec industry, that's where I'm concentrating. I assume most people could improve regardless of industry about cooperative problem solving. Project or program management. If you have ever been in a role playing group, you understand that the graphic up there about organizing your RPG session is accurate, whether it's virtual or in person. So, Again, this is not a hard technical skill. However, there are some, when you're really getting to like PMP or Project Plus and some of the more advanced project management activities, I would say that there's quite a bit that you need to understand and know, especially when it comes to, to budgeting um, and project planning. And you may be familiar with this. If you're in an RPG group or you've run RPGs as a game master, Man, any activity with these multiple people is difficult to plan, right? So these skills are going to translate into things you do at work, right? So what are we going to do about food, right? Let's just take that as an example. Like, well, what if we have people with special diets? What if we have somebody who has an allergy? What if we have somebody who has that weird like cilantro thing? So if we get Mexican, they can't have that because it tastes like soap to them, whatever that's called, right? How are we going to deal with the payment? What about like Fred who like hasn't paid the last two times? Well, what about that? Does he not have the money? Like let's actually let's actually use you know problem solving skills to try and tackle some of these things, right? What do we want to do in the in-game planning? So if you're running the games and it's not a pre-made game, right? You're running your own scenarios, which is what I prefer to do. Um, you know, what's your what's your story arc? What's the, what do the sessions look like to get me to where the story arc wants to be at the right time for the right progression of the character levels so that the project can, 
can be delivered to the client wait now so that we can get to the right story arc at the right time for where i want the players to be at the right level right a lot of this a lot of this is going to translate into your project or program management you just hadn't thought about it that way yet right calendars emails invites coordination my daughter who is in college has some of the best organizational skills I've seen compared to people that I have had to work with who are making six-figure salaries. If you, if you are someone who's really comfortable about making sure when you send an Outlook calendar to invite to go to the schedule checker to make sure everybody's free at the time that you send the meeting invite, do you have any idea? Do you have any idea how helpful that is? Right, so all of those little things, especially if you're trying to break into the field or a junior that you think maybe aren't actually important work skills, they're important work skills. They're gonna get noticed by the people who hopefully are mentoring you as you work on maybe some of the more technical skills that you're currently upskilling. We mentioned communication, right? Communication is so critical. And so is understanding that these skills can translate over into your work setting. Creativity and imagination, right? So this is really important for cybersecurity because what we're doing isn't working. You may have noticed this year a number of high-level breaches. I don't know, maybe you kind of caught some things about that. Um, so the United States continues to spend uh, uh, money it is to me hard to even imagine incalculable and we continue to mostly do the things that we were doing pre-breach five years ago for the most part so we are making strides but i'd say it's slow going right so now we're starting to see a lot about purple teaming Right, and it's not just bringing the red team and the blue team together because they're just going to argue and apparently get in some sort of like jujitsu fist fight. Right, there's actually a lot of skill in getting that to work as a purple team. It's not just inviting them to the same conference room or Zoom call. Okay, have you built up trust? Are there good lines of communication? Is there cooperative problem solving? Did you check to see if they're all available on the calendar before you invited them? What's the goal of the meeting? Did we send out pre-meeting notes or are we still sending out meetings with no details because please stop doing that. I'm not going to come to the meeting. Is there an agenda? Can I have an agenda? Why am I here? I'm a red teamer. I'm not a purple teamer. This is the way we've always done it. Everyone who is also a veteran has heard that answer to the question of why are we doing this this way? probably more than one time the military is very slow to adapt as are most government organizations that i have worked with very slow to adapt so we have to use our consulting business knowledge and prowess to shoehorn creativity and imagination sometimes to help them it's not always natural for certain organizations to embrace change right so through change, and when we're changing for the better, we can use our creativity and imagination. In my opinion, this is a critical skill in this industry that we don't talk about a lot, right? So it could be as simple as we need an analogy that the users will understand, right? Because the users don't know what a phishing email is. And we've probably confused them by using phishing, because Bobby goes phishing and he has no idea that there's supposed to be an analogy. No one's ever told him the analogy before. So it's very confusing, right? So this creativity and imagination can help in a multitude of ways, regardless of where you're at in your specialization in cybersecurity. Oh, I inherited this excuse. Seven years, seven years, Chuck. This is what they gave me when I started, right? So this is the same incident response plan we've had for five years. We just update the date. 
Yeah, is it only stored on the SharePoint drive? Because that's going to be down if there's a ransomware attack. Do we have this printed somewhere, right? And since I'm mostly in the cyber threat intel and tell side of this wor world, the creativity and imagination helps us think like an adversary, right? So for all of the people that aspire to be pen testers or red teamers or cyber threat intelligence people, you know, what will the adversary do? All right, so we can take that at any level from tactical to strategic about what the adversary is gonna do. There was an excellent Twitter thread yesterday, and now I'm going down a rabbit hole, about a former intelligence person on Twitter basically explained why we're never gonna go to war with China. And I was very excited by this. Because what we hear all the time is that our defense spending is necessary because we have to be successful in at least two, two, large, wars, two large simultaneous engagements, right? It's a reason we spend like a bajillion Bitcoin on the DoD every year, right? And have 10 nuclear aircraft carriers. Let's actually get people who understand China holistically to explain to me why it might be unlikely we go to war with China. Where's that discussion? Where can I watch that panel discussion, right? So that's at the most strategic level. Right, I could bring that all the way down to tactical about like what controls are most important. What controls are most important that we maybe want to focus on as a blue team, as a defender, based on our industry vertical, based on the threats that have previously and that we think are most likely to target me. But I have to understand the adversary. I have to understand the ransomware operators. I have to understand the North Korean APT and why they're actually pretty significantly different from the Iranian APTs and understand that different Iranian APTs are different from other Iranian APTs. But I have to actually understand how the adversary thinks. That requires creativity and imagination because I'm a white guy who was born in America. And I actually grew up in West Virginia, so sometimes I can even pretend to have a West Virginia accent. Mm -hmm. Conflict resolution. So you think conflict resolution is difficult to do at work? Try conflict resolution with a group of some of your best friends around a role-playing game, right? So I think there's no better way to get better at conflict resolution at work across whatever the conflict might be than to have had repeated conflict resolution on the role-playing tabletop game with your friends. Right? I mean, friendships could be on the line. Has anyone else ever had to like ask someone to not return to the role playing group? Boy, can that be awkward. I think I've ruined at least one friendship that way. So there's some lessons learned there, right? So again, some empathy. We're talking about building relationships, losing relationships, right? Having problematic relationships with your friends, maybe family, if you play with your family, right? And the conflicts in Dungeons and Dragons or in any RPG, right? It could be around any number of different factors, just like conflict resolutions at work can be around any number of factors at work. One of the current ones that you will soon be involved in, no doubt, is do we allow everyone to continue to telework all of the time? Boy, that's going to be interesting. And there are gonna be some companies and organizations that get it right, and there are gonna be some that don't get it right. I can guarantee that. And that will come around empathy. It's gonna come around influence, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, I also think a lot of conflict resolution and some of the concepts that I've talked about already here and other speakers have talked about also goes into social engineering. And yes, social engineering is basically a specialty that you can have a job in, right? So you can be, known and, and concentrate and upskill social engineering as part of engagements that use social engineering. I learned probably two years ago that there's in there, there's physical pen testing. I didn't know that was the thing. That sounds pretty cool. Um, so a lot of these uh, topics in this presentation so far are gonna be critical in the workplace. And again, if you're a junior person, and you think that these are some of your strengths, then lean into your strengths as you upskill other areas. So I could probably make this presentation go on for like three hours, but I think I'd probably lose some of you. 
I really appreciated the keynote this morning. And this is the first time that I've had sort of an end of the day presentation. And I was editing this, this uh, PowerPoint as the day went on to make sure I hit upon some of the same things from earlier. The soft skills aren't optional. We all know some people who think they're optional. Those aren't people I enjoy working with or working for. So if you find people who think soft skills are optional, they're going to have a reputation, whether it's widely known or not. They're going to have a reputation on their team, with their employees. Their bosses probably know who they are. And someone like that will possibly get far in certain aspects of our industry if their technical skills are really good. I think that that's unfortunately very problematic. The people who have soft skills and technical skills are the sorts of people that I want to work with hire and work for and i think that that's important so i don't care whether you're junior or a CISO watching this soft skills are critical to this industry they should be considered in the hiring process and they should be considered in people's career development but if you're into dungeons and dragons and role-playing games there's all sorts of skills up here that i think are vital somebody right now is probably thinking he has root cause analysis listed up there what? Root cause analysis. We have an evil wizard who has created a cursed magical item that he is using to enslave villagers in this village. How would you guys like to tackle this problem? I'll tell you, right now, there's some root cause analysis and cooperative problem solving happening in that D&D group, right? Five whys. Why is the wizard doing this, right? Uh, because he was betrayed by the king. Why did the king betray him? Well, actually, the king's not a really good person. He betrayed him because the wizard was going to try to out him because the king was stealing all kinds of money from all the people, saying he was putting it back into you know, infrastructure projects, but really he was just banking it in an offshore goblin account. Why is nobody investigating this? And why are we working for the king again when he's actually the bad guy? There, five whys in the D&D scenario, right? Problem solving. Some other things that I think are going to be really important is active listening. We've kind of talked about communication a little bit. There are some really excellent communicators when they're communicating at you. We probably all know some people like this, but they are not good at listening, right? So active listening is a skill you pick up in D&D real quick, right? Because the DM will say something like, are you sure you want to do that? And then you have to be like, oh my goodness, am I sure? So I'm going to wrap up in about another two minutes. Um, we have some gamification and storytelling. Those are big things in our industry that are coming about. If you're familiar with role playing, then those are areas in the industry that are growing that you can lean into. So my last little bit here is, so if the non-tech or soft skills are so critical, where's the training? I've hired multiple people. I've gone through zero training about the correct way to hire people. I've written job recs. I have zero training about how to write job recs. I do have some training on some of the soft skills. I was lucky enough to attend the Air Force OSI two week uh, in-person training for leaders where we talked about emotional and IQ, which is EQ and communication. But in this industry, if we are gonna tell people that the non-tech skills are critical, we also have to identify training and make training available for the non-technical skills as well. So that's sort of the last thing I added in here. And this is more of a something for us all to think about because for any, for any of these problems to get solved, it's gonna take all of us to, to try and help solve the problems. So I'm on Twitter. I'm at one Mr. Stoner. You shoot me an email. I'll get back to you if you have questions. And I think there is about 15 minutes before the keynote. So I'm going to keep an eye on Discord, and if there are questions, I will be over in the expert track to answer your questions. Or if you have questions later, you can always hit me up on, on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. I am not the John Stoner that works at Splunk. That is another person who is my doppelganger. And despite trying to contact John Stoner, he has not replied to me. Uh, he has spoken at Sands. That is a different John Stoner. But I think that's a wrap for me today.
That was wonderful. All right. So I feel like you came in chaotic good, but you left lawful good. Mm. <laughs> it Great. was good throughout. Oh. Were there any questions that I missed in the... Um, I mean, there were a lot of comments on your jokes and your and your various phrases that we thought were funny. Um, I don't think I missed any comments. Okay. Or, or I mean, uh, yeah, questions. 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 I scrolled through. I noticed that you were like replying in real time while still giving your talk, and I was like, that is a level of multitasking in the brain. That yeah, how'd you do that? Frankly, I don't have. I have. I have four screens up, so I always have a timer up somewhere on one screen, so I know where my time's at. And then on this screen, I just kind of, you know, try to look. Multitasking. It, it, real was... quick, fun, real quick, funny story on that is when I was still in the army, had all my Merc channels up because that's what we used, and I had like 20 Merc channels up on one of my big screens, supporting real-time operations in Afghanistan, and one of the real senior. Uh, officials walked by and was just like, are you reading all of this? Do you know what's going on? And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my job, sir. And, and it's funny because as we uh, bring more tech to like the soldier on the battlefield, they are so used to so many inputs from like video games, especially, and all the tech everybody has all the time. It's really interesting that I think humans are changing to be able to process um, more information real time from multiple sources. That's very, very interesting. It definitely might be something that you're better at at age 25 than age 44 as well. I'm not saying it is, but it might be. It might be one of those things too. I mean, I think there's it, also a level of true. structure that you apply to it as well. Have you ever run a military war game that had cyber in it? Uh, not directly. I was involved in some exercises a little bit, um, but not some of the full scale ones. But actually, for one unit, I did develop, the closest I would say I did was developing sort of this uh, capstone exercise where we made an entire sort of like quasi anonymous hacker-esque you know, we had like their fake Twitter profiles and fake news articles and everything like that. And that was sort of gamification of the capstone. Um, and we would run that routinely. Um, someone else mentioned backdoors and breaches. I am also an incident master with hackback gaming, which is sort of like a new thing where we do like a two hour RPG style incident response. And I've been involved in a couple of those. They've been super fun because most tabletops around incident response are generally not fun. So there's a lot of stuff like backdoors and breaches and hackback gaming, and you're gonna see more of this. Gamification is a big thing. Um, the military is really into gamification of training and a lot of, a lot of the commercial sector is moving that direction. I, uh, well, I wanna take the moment the to give a- behind... oh, Go ahead, please. Uh, give a shout out to a, a founder of mine um, named Kenan Skelly, who has created a company called Insight. And she's done that where they have gamified um, cyber hygiene learning, right? Everybody who's been DOD remembers your terrible so annual bad. training requirement, right? Everybody just clicks through it, and everything, right? And so um, that's something I'm hoping to bring to the next GrimCon uh, is the opportunity for folks to get to play that. Yeah, we we all we all love doing those trainings that only run in like the oldest web browser possible. Man, you must use IE nine and have Java enabled for this DoD. Never mind, never mind. ActiveX. It's, it's, it's not as bad as the job. The I think uh, the New Jersey or something like that. Their um, unemployment website. It it said you can use IE seven or Netscape, um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, it's so wow. bad. Uh, I mean, I think that's a real, like, that would demonstrate that you have a lot of information security knowledge. If you can install and run, like, Mosaic, then you're good at this stuff. I get that's it. The next, that's the next, like, CTF is, like, the first person to install Windows 3.3 to, like, go get some flags or whatever. Yeah. I, 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 that's worthy. I I have absolutely spent, like, at least three hours in a CTF trying to install Sage Math with the right Python, and then it took me an hour to actually write the write the solution. 
Uh, but I was going to say, I, I learned um, how to uh, write exploits uh, through CTF. And I think it was the gamified atmosphere that made it so fun and entertaining for, for me. I, I, I don't think that I would have wanted to spend my weekends uh, doing this at the very beginning had I not been surrounded by people and had we not been trying to um, rank uh, on CTF time. So <clears throat> I think there's a lot of um, educational components and upskilling components that could get gamified because if I have to attend another boot camp, which I actually have to attend a PMP boot camp, but I'm so tired of like that sort of training and that sort of methodology, um, I would much rather have some PMP RPG because it would be fun, right? And I think right in the chat earlier we were talking about this a little bit and um you know about the gamification and like the training issues um if the training was fun we also might be able to like get some people that otherwise wouldn't be in the field interested in the field earlier as well right because we're we're also not solving the job shortage uh everything we're doing in the industry is not working well I will say I, I did just take a training that was not gamified at all, but it was like tried to have a fun GUI and it was far more painful than just the uh, boring, boring train, <laughs> trainings because I couldn't, I couldn't click through it. I had to sit. Oh man, it was, uh, it was a time. Yeah, <laughs> as opposed to trainings that don't let you advance the slide or pause if you click out of the tab, I'm I'm looking at you, big consulting firms in particular, to make sure I do the training. Maybe we could make the training better and more interesting. There's a hack to this. 508 compatibility. Is, is, which so one? Folks with disabilities have to be able yeah. to access the content. So if you go through 508, you can just read the text and get through it, and you're not beholden to the video. That's a good shout. Well, let me uh, let me get off of here so we get the keynote started.